Thusness, seven stages of enlightenment. Stage one, the experience of I am. It was about 20 years back, and it all started with the question, before birth, who am I? I do not know why, but this question seemed to capture my entire being. I could spend days and nights just sitting focusing pondering over this question, till one day, everything seemed to come to a complete standstill. Not even a single thread of thought arose. There was merely nothing and completely void, only this pure sense of existence, this mere sense of I, this presence. What was it? It was not the body not thought, as there were no thoughts. Nothing at all. Just existence itself. There was no need for anyone to authenticate this understanding. At that moment of realization, I experienced a tremendous flow of energy being released. It was as if life was expressing itself through my body, and I was nothing but this expression. However, at that point in time, I was still unable to fully understand what this experience was and how I had misunderstood its nature. Stage two, the experience of I am everything. It seemed that my experience was supported by many Advaita and Hindu teachings. But the biggest mistake I made was when I spoke to a Buddhist friend. He told me about the doctrine of no self, of no I. I rejected such doctrine outright, as it was in direct contradiction with what I had experienced. I was deeply confused for some time, and could not appreciate why Buddha had taught this doctrine, and worse still, made it a Dharma seal, until one day I experienced the fusing of everything into me, but somehow there was no me. It was like an eyeless I. I somehow accepted the no I idea but then I still insisted the Buddha shouldn't have put it that way. The experience was wonderful. It was as if I was totally emancipated, a complete release without boundary. I told myself, I am totally convinced that I am no longer confused. So I wrote a poem, something like the below. I am the rain. I am the sky. I am the blueness, the color of the sky. Nothing is more real than I. Therefore, Buddha, I am I. There is a phrase for this experience. Whenever and wherever there is, the is is me. This phrase was like a mantra to me. I often used this to lead me back into the experience of presence. The rest of the journey was the unfolding and further refinement of this experience of total presence. But somehow, there was always this blockage, this something preventing me from recapturing the experience. It was the inability to fully die into total presence. Stage three, entering into a state of nothingness. Somehow something was blocking the natural flow of my innermost essence and preventing me from reliving the experience. Presence was still there, but there was no sense of totality. It was both logically and intuitively clear that I was the problem. It was the I that was blocking. It was the I that was the limit. It was the I that was the boundary. But why couldn't I do away with it? At that point in time, it didn't occur to me that I should look into the nature of awareness and what awareness is all about. Instead, I was too occupied with the art of entering into a state of oblivion to get rid of the I. This continued for the next 13 plus years. In between, of course, there were many other minor events, and the experience of total presence did occur many times, but with gaps a few months long. However, I came to one important understanding. The I is the root cause of all artificialities. True freedom is in spontaneity. Surrender into complete nothingness and everything is simply self-so. Stage four, 
presence as mirror bright clarity. I got in touch with Buddhism in 1997, not because I wanted to find out more about the experience of presence, but rather the teaching of impermanence synced deeply with what I was experiencing in life. I was faced with the possibility of losing all my wealth and more by financial crisis. At that point in time, I had no idea that Buddhism is so profoundly rich on the aspect of presence. The mystery of life cannot be understood. I sought for a refuge in Buddhism to alleviate my sorrows caused by the financial crisis but it turned out to be the missing key toward experiencing total presence. I wasn't that resistant then to the doctrine of no self, but the idea that all phenomenal existence is empty of an inherent self, or self with a capital S, did not quite get into me. Were they talking about the self as a personality or self as eternal witness? Must we do away even with the witness? Was the witness itself another illusion? There is thinking, no thinker. There is sound, no hearer. Suffering exists, no sufferer. Deeds there are, no doer. I was meditating on the meaning of the above stanza deeply until one day, suddenly I heard <coughs> It was so clear, there was nothing else, just the sound and nothing else and resounding. It was so clear, so vivid. That experience was so familiar, so real, and so clear. It was the same experience of I am. It was without thought, without concepts, without intermediary, without anyone there, without any in-between. What was it? It was pure presence. But this time, it was not I am. It was not asking, who am I? It was not the pure sense of I am. It was the pure sound. Then came taste, just the taste and nothing else. The heartbeats, the scenery. There was no gap in between, no longer a few months gap for it to arise. There never was a stage to enter, no eye to cease, and never had it existed. There is no entry and exit point. There is no sound out there or in here. There is no I apart from the arising and ceasing. The manifold of presence, moment to moment presence unfolds. This is the beginning of seeing through no self. Insight into no self has arisen, but non-dual experience is still very much Brahman rather than Shunyata. In fact, it is more Brahman than ever. Now I am this is experienced in all. Nevertheless, it is a very important key phase where the practitioner experiences a quantum leap in perception, untying the dualistic knot. This is also the key insight leading to the realization that all is mind. All is just this one reality. The tendency to extrapolate an ultimate reality or universal consciousness where we are part of this reality, remains surprisingly strong. Effectively, the dualistic knot is gone, but the bond of seeing things inherently isn't. Dualistic and inherent knots that prevent the full experiencing of our maha, empty, and non-dual nature of pristine awareness are two very different perceptual spells that bind. Stage five, no mirror reflecting. There is no mirror reflecting. All along, manifestation alone is. The one hand claps, everything is. Effectively, phase four is merely the experience of non-division between subject-object. The initial insight glimpsed from the anatta stanza is without self, but in the later phase of my progress, it appeared more like subject-object as an inseparable union rather than absolutely no subject. This is precisely the second case in the three levels of understanding non-dual. I was still awed by the pristineness and vividness of phenomena in phase four. Phase five is quite thorough in being no one, and I would call this anatta in all three aspects. 
no subject-object division, no doership, an absence of agent. The trigger point here is the direct and thorough seeing that the mirror is nothing more than an arising thought. With this, the solidity and all the grandeur of Brahman goes right down the drain. Yet, it feels perfectly right and liberating without the agent and being simply as an arising thought or as a vivid moment of a bell resounding. All the vividness and presence remains with an additional sense of freedom. Here, a mirror reflection union is clearly understood as flawed. There is only vivid reflection. There cannot be a union if there isn't a subject to begin with. It is only in subtle recalling, that is, in a thought recalling a previous moment of thought, that the watcher seems to exist. From here, I moved toward the third degree of non-dual. The stanza one complements and refines stanza two to make the experience of no-self thorough and effortless into just only chirping birds, drum beats, footsteps, sky, mountain, walking, chewing, and tasting. No witness whatsoever hiding anywhere. Everything is a process, event, manifestation, and phenomenon. Nothing ontological or having an essence. This phase is very thorough in non-dual experience. There is effortlessness in the non-dual, and one realizes that in seeing there is always just scenery, and in hearing, always just sounds. We find true delights in naturalness and ordinariness, as commonly expressed in Zen as chop wood, carry water, spring comes, grass grows. With regards to ordinariness, this must also be correctly understood. Non-dual is ordinary, as there is no beyond stage to arrive at. It appears to be extraordinary and grandeur only as an afterthought due to comparison. That said, the Maha experience appearing as universe chewing and the spontaneity of pristine happening must still remain Maha, free, boundless and clear. For that is what it is and cannot be otherwise. The extraordinariness and grandeur that result from comparison must also be correctly discerned from the what is of non-dual. Whenever contraction steps in, it is simply a manifestation of experience, experiencer, split. Conventionally speaking, that being the cause, that is the effect. Whatever the condition is, be it the result of unfavorable situations or subtle recalling to arrive at a certain good sensation or attempting to fix an imaginary split, we have to treat it that the non-dual insight has not pervaded into our entire being like the way karmic tendency to divide does. We have not fearlessly, openly, and unreservedly welcomed whatever is. Just my view, a casual sharing. Practitioners up to this level often get overexcited believing that this phase is final. In fact, it does appear to be a sort of pseudo-finality. But this is a misunderstanding. Nothing much can be said. The practitioner will also be naturally led into spontaneous perfection without going further in emptying the aggregates. The drop is thorough. The center is gone. The center is nothing more than a subtle karmic tendency to divide. A more poetic expression would be, sound hears, scenery sees, the dust is the mirror. Transient phenomena themselves have always been the mirror. Only a strong dualistic view prevents the seeing. Very often cycles after cycles of refining our insights are needed to make the non-dual less concentrative and more effortless. This relates to experiencing the non-solidity and spontaneity of experience. At this phase, we must be clear that emptying the subject will only result in non-duality, and there is a need to further empty the aggregates. 18 datus. This means one must further penetrate the emptiness nature of the five aggregates. 18 datus, with dependent origination and emptiness. The need to reify a universal Brahman is understood as the karmic tendency to solidify experiences. This leads to the understanding of empty nature of non-dual presence. Stage 6. 
the nature of presence is empty. Stage four and five are the gray scale of seeing through the subject, that it does not exist in actuality, anatta. There are only the aggregates. However, even the aggregates are empty, heart sutra. It may sound obvious, but more often than not, even a practitioner who has matured the anatta experience, as in phase five, will miss the essence of it. As I have said earlier, phase five does appear to be final and it is pointless to emphasize anything. Whether one proceeds further to explore this empty nature of presence and move into the Maha world of suchness will depend on our conditions. At this juncture, it is necessary to have clarity on what emptiness is not to prevent misunderstandings. Emptiness is not a substance. Emptiness is not a substratum or a background. Emptiness is not light. Emptiness is not consciousness or awareness. Emptiness is not the absolute. Emptiness does not exist on its own. Objects do not consist of emptiness. Objects do not arise from emptiness. Emptiness of the eye does not negate the eye. Emptiness is not the feeling that results when no objects are appearing to the mind. Meditating on emptiness does not consist of quieting the mind. And I would like to add, emptiness is not a path of practice, and emptiness is not a form of fruition. Emptiness is the nature of all experiences. There is nothing to attain or practice. What we have to realize is this empty nature, this ungraspability, unlocatability, and interconnectedness nature of all vivid arising. Emptiness will reveal that not only is there no who in pristine awareness, there is no where and when, be it I, here, or now. All are simply impressions that dependently originate in accordance with the principles of conditionality. When there is this, that is. With the arising of this, that arises. When this is not, neither is that. With the cessation of this, that ceases. The profundity of this four-liner principle of conditionality is not in words. For a more theoretical exposition, see Non-Dual Emptiness Teachings by Dr. Greg Good. For a more experiential narration, see the subsection on emptiness on Maha of the post on Anatta, No Self, Emptiness, Maha and Ordinariness, and Spontaneous Perfection. Here, practice is clearly understood as neither going after the mirror nor escaping from the Maya reflection. It is to thoroughly see the nature of reflection, to see that there is really no mirror other than the ongoing reflection due to our emptiness nature. Neither is there a mirror to cling to as the background reality, nor a Maya to escape from. Beyond these two extreme lies the middle path, the prajna wisdom of seeing that the maya is our buddha nature recently an eternal now has updated some very high quality articles that better describe the maha experience of suchness do read the following articles emancipation of suchness buddha dharma a dream in a dream the last three subsections of the on emptiness post elaborates this phase of emptiness insight and the gradual progress of maturing the experience into the effortless mode of practice. It is important to know that in addition to the experience of the unfindability and ungraspability of emptiness, the interconnectedness of everything creating the Maha experience is equally precious. Stage 7. Presence is spontaneously perfected. After cycles and cycles of refining our practice and insights, we will come to this realization. Anatta is a seal, not a stage. Awareness has always been non-dual. Appearances have always been non-arising. All phenomena are interconnected and by nature maha. All are always and already so. Only dualistic and inherent views are obscuring these experiential facts. And therefore, what is really needed is simply to experience whatever arises openly and unreservedly. However, this does not denote the end of practice. 
Practice simply moves to become dynamic and conditions manifestation-based. The ground and the path of practice become indistinguishable. The entire article of ananata, emptiness, etc., can be seen as the different approaches toward the eventual realization of this already perfect and uncontrived nature awareness. For more, check out Awakening to Reality dot com or find the link beneath this video. Start with the must reads section. Also feel free to join the Facebook group called Awakening to Reality.